Thank you. Welcome to everybody. I, this is Heidi, and um, I've read your chapter. Enrique, I haven't read yours, um, but I've read Nana's. Um, very interesting. I love the, the approach that you used. I'm sure you're going to go into that shortly. Uh, Carlin, you're really, I like your historical um, approach to the American uh, Economics Institute. Um, and uh, I think Christopher's chapters, uh, one was on uh, the Atlantic Drift that actually brought both the U.S., and the EU supranational think tanks together. Um, and then his second chapter in there, um, which directly followed mine, talks about the future uh, of um, work or research in the EU supranational context. So there's a lot of, of interesting chapters in this book. Um, I'm not sure who wants to go first, maybe the, the two the, on the US think tanks first. I'm happy to uh, begin and to say thank you to the editors for inviting me to contribute to this volume. Mine is a very personal history of a think tank, the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, one of the oldest think tanks in the city. And I became interested in the subject of think tank history in Washington because I realized that my think tank, AEI, was the only major think tank without a written history. So unfortunately, that fortunately or unfortunately, that job fell to me. So in observing AEI over a period of its entire history since it was founded in 1938 in New York City and then moved to Washington in 1943, I was able to look more broadly at think tanks in the Washington community, how they've changed, but I was also able to look at my think tank through the perspective of five different presidents. Um, I didn't know the first two very well at all. I was very junior at that point. Um, but it's been an interesting, it's been very interesting to me to look at how these think tanks have changed over time. There were very sleepy places when the history of AI began, um, very sleepy indeed, but that's changed dramatically with the proliferation of think tanks in the United States with uh, the model that AEI generally follows, the university without students, very much like the Brookings Institution. And of course, we now have the advocacy institutes and also uh, the government contract research institute. So it's a very busy think tank landscape. It's changed in very dramatic ways. And I'll leave my introduction uh, at that point. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nana de Graaf and I contribute to, to this handbook. I haven't read it like you, Heidi, yeah. so uh, that's uh, impressive. I also didn't receive it yet, so I'm also jealous of this hard copy I see in your hands, but uh, well, that's ahead of me. Yeah, the chapter that I contributed together with Bastian van Apeldoorn, I should say, uh, with whom I, I co-author a, a lot on US uh, foreign policy making and uh, policy makers, is about Trump and the foreign policy elite uh, think tank network. Uh, of which one uh, is, is is your uh, think tank, Carlin? So it's uh, it's an honor to uh, to be in the same panel with you. It's fun. Um, and we see think tanks as part of wider elite networks and as channels of intra-elite consensus shaping and policy planning and and, and networking. So the way we uh, analyze and interpret the role of think tanks is not only as sources of independent policy advice, but also as pools of recruitment for uh, top positions in uh, US administrations. Uh, and um, so in that sense, we see uh, the think tanks not just as part of a policy planning network and the people that work there as policy planners, uh, but they often also later onwards become the policy makers and they are in a position to, of power to actually implement the policies they have been advising on earlier. So I, I, I don't know about uh, your future uh, career uh, uh, intentions, Carlin, but maybe we find you once uh, in the administration uh, as well. <laughs> no, you will stay safely in the think tank. Stay out of politics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and I prepared a, what, a somewhat longer uh, introduction of, of the chapter and, and its findings. So I'd, I'm not sure now what to uh, what to do. Don, do you still want to provide like a more general uh, introduction to, to the panel, or because we're now doing quick introductions, or do you uh, want me to say yeah. a bit more about it? No, and, and if you could just talk really about the major findings in your chapter, uh, which is is actually a, a fascinating read that you and your colleague have have put together. But maybe if you can just highlight your major findings and then yeah. we'll move on and then I'll have some questions. Chris and I will have questions for yeah. each of you and then hopefully you'll be able to engage with each other. Yeah, so in our research, we, we are not so much interested in the think tanks as such, uh, but we, we start actually from the policymakers. 
and the way they are linked to think tanks, uh, both in terms of personal ties and, and, and recurrent ties, uh, and, and uh, in terms of the wider elite networks of, of which they are part and of which these think tanks are, are part. And the broader argument is that these foreign policy makers are not uh, making foreign policy in a kind of ideational social vacuum once they have been appointed and, and, and uh, or elected, but that they are actually embedded in these wider social networks of which the think tanks are, are one key area. And, and the embeddedness in these social networks basically shapes their interests, their worldviews, their ideas, and therefore also in turn influences the policies they make. Of course, always in, in response to and interrelated with the context, which is like a global context, but also a domestic uh, societal uh, context. And in this chapter, we, um, we first show, uh, based on actually earlier work, um, a network of uh, uh, top foreign policy makers uh, of various administrations going back to the Clinton administration um, uh, and, and we show on the basis of the personal ties based on, the, on an analysis of the CVs and bios of these persons, these top foreign policy makers, how they have been linked to various uh, policy planning uh, bodies, think tanks in, uh, in, in, in the US. And what we found is that there is uh, they are extensively linked to these networks uh, and also recurrently linked to these networks. So you see this revolving door uh, pattern. Um, but we also find like a core of uh, policy planning think tanks uh, that are recurrently connected to different uh, administrations, democratic uh, administrations, but also Republican administrations. And we've, we call that like the core foreign policy elite uh, uh, network. Uh, and what we did in this chapter was to see to what extent the Trump administration, which of course is a very different kind of administration with a different kind of US foreign policy, uh, to what extent they were uh, connected or disconnected to this policy planning network or maybe connected to other, uh, other policy planning uh, networks. Um, and unsurprisingly, of course, we found that there was this huge disconnect between the Trump administration's top uh, foreign policy makers and this central network of uh, uh, think tanks that have been informing and, and kind of influencing uh, US foreign policy administrations for decades. Um, and then we, we do an analysis, uh, a brief analysis of how that then relates to foreign policy making they're actually, um, they're actually uh, formulating and, and implementing. Um, and uh, well, I, I think that um, I, I will leave it here and then I hope that in the Q&A we can get back to various aspects of, of, of these findings and the implications of these findings and also some looking ahead to the next administration and what this may imply for, uh, for the next administration. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, Heidi, please. Yes. Thanks, Don. Hi, everyone. So my uh, chapter looked at EU think tanks, supranational think tanks based in Brussels. Um, and I basically updated uh, an earlier work from 2004, identifying a typology um, or activities of what these supranational think tanks um, do. And then I looked at how waves of these think tanks of the development of think tanks based on um, activities that were going on during that time. So those activities that I looked at were um, the various uh, treaties that were signed during that time that changed the institutional balance of the European Union. Um, I looked at uh, um, enlargements that again changed the geopolitical uh, balance within the European Union. Um, and then finally I looked at a series of crises that uh, we all know started in around 2007 and they were significant crises um, for the EU as well. Most of them were for the world as well. Um, so what the typology is, some of these activities, um, and there, you know, I know that Chris and, and his work as well, we're looking at activities, roles uh, of these think tanks. So my typology uh, was basically one is that they act in research and analyses. They produce that. Uh, they foster debate, uh, promote engagement through networks, um, and they also util utilize innovative tools. And Caroline, I know that you talk a little bit about how some of the, the AEI also used a lot of communications tools as well, same period as well. I thought that was fascinating. Um, so the three waves that I, I identify are um, about 1980 to 2000. Uh, then we have a significant enlargement in wave two, that's 2001, 2007, uh, and then wave three, 2007, uh, and then currently. And so identify, I select uh, nine, supranational think tanks. There are a few more, but I focused primarily on those. 
And what my findings were was that in the wave one, that's when really that was in the 1980s, the golden age of, of European integration. We had one of the main treaties, the Single European Act, come in. Um, and those three, there were three of them, the Center for European Policy Studies, the European Policy Center and Friends of Europe, they were primarily, particularly the first SEPs in particular, very much research-based producing that. The others were producing engagement as well, um, and they were used, utilizing their, their areas, their, their think tanks, to bring people together. Okay, but primarily focused on the European Commission um, and, and research for the most part. Way two, uh, we saw a couple of things here. First off, we saw two treaties. Uh, the Treaty of Nice and the Treaty of Lisbon that gave the European Parliament greater powers that shifted the balance. Um, we also saw as one of the key enlargements which moved uh, the, the borders eastwards. We brought in uh, eight um, former communist uh, countries coming into the EU. So there was a lot of stress there on bringing those people who didn't have a whole lot of um, experience with democratic um, approaches, bringing those into the EU. Um, um, and then we also saw a regulation occur that gave the gave uh, institutes that were connected to the, some of the European uh, Union uh, parties, they gave them budget. So we saw a significant increase there. Um, and we saw, again, across the spectrum, the political spectrum, the European Ideas Network, um, we saw the Foundation of Euro uh, European Progressive Studies, the European Liberal Forum, and the, uh, the Martin Center. So again, what we saw during the second wave was that they were really expanding their networks and they were looking more on um, to foster debate and engagement. And then when we moved to the third wave, um, we saw again, because it was the start of these crises that we saw and others have written on that, that the policymakers in the, in, in the commission and the parliament really wanted to see expertise. They wanted to be able to base what they were proposing on real research. So we saw, and at the same time during this period, um, we saw innovation coming out. We saw Facebook, Twitter, so a lot, a shift in the way that their results were being communicated. So some of the, um, the two key um, think tanks that came up here, um, one was the Brussels European and Global Economic Laboratory, or Bruegel, um, and then also within the commission was the European Political Strategy Center, EPSC. I um, mean, they were very innovative in the way that they produced their research uh, Bruegel worked with member states directly. They were connected. That was innovation right there. They also had a very innovative way uh, and do have a very innovative way of, of pr uh, promoting and communicating their, um, their results. Um, so, and finally, in the, the, all of them use policy networks to a varying degree. Some of them, again, the, in the second way, because they wanted to establish connections in the new, um, the newer countries, uh, they established Member, they had a lot of partnerships in those countries, had a lot of um, institutional connections there. Um, Bruegel, because of their connections to member states, um, they had member state connections, but all of them working, those that worked in research had a lot of epistemic networks as well. There were personal networks that were based on ideas and approaches. Um, so that is the, a brief summary of my um, chapter. So I'm gonna hand it back, I think, to Don. Okay, well, thank you so much, Heidi, and I'm sure Chris will uh, follow up with, with some questions for you. I wanted to turn to you, Carlin, first. You, you mm -hmm. have been in an enviable position for many years, and so far as you've had a front row seat uh, to one of the most, in, or at one of the most important uh, policy think tanks, uh, not only in the United States, but, but around the world. Your chapter focuses on AEI's evolution through four different presidencies, and I, I thought you really captured the essence of this very, very important institute, not only by focusing on the kind of output uh, that AEI has produced, but the different personalities involved and what they brought to the decision-making process in AEI. So I'm wondering after you've had a chance to reflect on AEI through the lens of four presidencies, if you could just share with our audience you know, some of the, some of the key observations that you had going back into the archives and, and really kind of piecing this together. And then if you could kind of look for, you know, look ahead and what we might expect from AEI, you know, in the decades to come. So if I could ask you to look in both directions at the same time, 
what you've learned from AEI's distinguished history and how you see the organization moving forward. Thank you, Dan. Those are very big questions. And let me focus uh, on looking back first. And I should say that I'm now looking at a fifth AEI president. So I've been at AEI. This is my 41st year, a very, very long time watching the evolution of the think tank. And I think there are some commonalities, as I said early on, the very early history of AEI and the other think tanks in Washington, they were very quiet places at that particular point, AEI included. There was a fraternization, there was a collaboration. Interestingly, I found a study that we did with Brookings in the late 1940s. So we were clearly very close to the scholars at, uh, at Brookings at that particular point. Again, there wasn't a lot of other activity going on. But one of the things that I've noticed about the presidents of AEI, and they were all different in, in distinct ways, but all of the think tanks that I looked at around the time of AEI's history, the other think tanks in Washington founded around the same time, uh, the resources for the future, the first example of a niche think tank, the environmental think tank, very highly regarded, uh, the Rand Corporation, 1946, again, very highly regarded, a very different kind of think tank. They've all stayed remarkably true to their original missions. And I think that that is an important fact. The other thing that I've noticed about all of these, these think tanks is that um, the presidents all had a unique eye for talent in different ways for finding people who might not have been on the public's radar screen or writers for the New York Times. And our presidents took a lot of time because AI is the kind of place where you're given an enormous amount of freedom once you're hired. So they're looking for people, particularly now, and I think this is true across the think tank community, up and comers, who will have those major policy positions, who will be able, as both Heidi and Nana said, to go in and out of administrations at a different point. We think that's very valuable to serve in administrations. We think that, that that brings you an extra dimension to your work at a place such as AEI or Brookings. And I tend to think of AEI and Brookings perhaps because I've worked most closely with, with Brookings um, over the years on a whole range of projects in my own area of public opinion and demography. Um, so those are, those are the two um, uh, two observations that are internal about AEI overall. The media environment, as Heidi has suggested, has changed very dramatically in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and also the focus, and this goes to Nana's point, um, at one point I think the think tanks were much more interested in only influencing elite opinion in Congress and the executive branch. I think that is changing a lot at a number of the think tanks in part because of the competition in the think tanks. So you're seeing much broader efforts to, re to reach uh, general audiences. I'm, I'm not sure what that means, whether it's, it's just part of the competition in the think tank community in Washington in particular, which again is the, the only area that I know, but the media environment has changed very fast. And just uh, and looking at the think tanks in Washington too, Shops are growing very fast at most think tanks. The first is the communications group with a whole team of younger people. I don't even understand what they do, um, but they are always promoting our work on so many different platforms, not only at AI, but also at the other think tanks. So, so that's something um, that again is a, is a very big change, trying to reach out to other folks. And the other shop that's growing at most think tanks in Washington is the development shops. Those people who are shaking the tin cup to keep us in business, finding donors because there's been a lot of consolidation over the years. Um, you know, corporations are less eager to give to think tanks than perhaps they were 20 or 30 years ago because they don't want to be involved in the political fray. We're watching a new development with some of these major, I guess you would call great financial firms having their own internal think tanks and they're able to say, gee, we're not part of the partisan fray in Washington. I think that's something I want to watch going forward very much. But because philanthropic giving patterns have changed a lot, you're seeing um, a, a lot more you know, a lot more people in the development shop that are that are seeking to fund the work that AI scholars do. We are, we are given just enormous independence in the work we do. We always have been, and that's a distinctive factor of AI, just another internal working item. All I'm required to do is write a memo to the president three times a year telling him what I'm working on. That's it. And um, he can often say, that's above your pay grade, Carlin, and perhaps you should focus on something else. Um, but it's um, it's a very it's a very changed atmosphere, but yet with some powerful continuities. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Did you have any follow-ups for Carlin? 
Well, I mean, certainly, uh, Carlin, I mean, I think being inside uh, the tent, if you will, in this uh, particular, let's say, episode of, uh, of our uh, kind of socioeconomic lives right now, and obviously in the midst of, um, of a global pandemic, I've often wondered uh, what impact this is having on think tanks on the operational side, more so, like you mentioned, on the development aspect of this given that in a lot of cases I've noticed think tanks in the U.S. and even certainly within Canada have turned to, for example, like in-person events or have tried to amplify in-person events as kind of a, 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 a very significant revenue stream for, for these organizations. So, I mean, within the context of, kind of one of the big five inside the Beltway with, uh, with AEI, I'm curious if you've noticed, first of all, if, if uh, you know, the, the transition from in-person to more remote style events has been a successful model for AI and, and certainly for your colleagues um, in, in Washington as well. Or if that's, uh, you know, and, and where kind of you see this going down the line, if it's necessarily the case that there will be a return to, to in-person events, for example, as much as we'd like that certainly to have a, a non-think tank conference in person. But I'm just wondering if the, if this agility and this nimbleness as a, uh, as a delivery model is something that AI may very well consider going forward. There was a steep learning curve for everyone in Washington with the pandemic to learn how to operate um, with virtual events. And we are almost entirely virtual right now. We in Brookings expect to go back um, to full-time staffs in the office, uh, again, depending on what DC rules tell us we're able to do um, in September. Mm -hmm. So that's a ways away. And at that point, we are contemplating a mix of both virtual and in-person events. We found that virtual events are very successful in a number of ways. Um, and the, the live stream of virtual events is what's particularly impressive to me. Um, I did an event on uh, the Trump presidency and for the work that I do, basically, and we had maybe five or 600 people on that call, but we've had 10,000 people watch it later when they had more time to watch. And um, that, to me, was absolutely extraordinary. And we're seeing that with all the events that people can watch on Saturday or Sunday afternoon. They don't have to tune in. They can tune in when they want. And that's affecting the way we think about events. But we very much hope, and I think that is also true of Brookings, to go back to a mix of virtual and in-person events, probably starting in September. Um, we do not charge for any of our events. Um, and we do have conferences around the country where we charge participants to come. Um, but I'm not sure you were talking about those. So. Yeah, absolutely. And if maybe uh, a question for Heidi, as um, as one of you know few researchers working in the space of supranational think tanks, you know, as relatively new organizations uh, on on the scene, certainly uh, within Brussels, but also I think in terms of the scholarly catch up that's been taking place, uh, like we've discussed over the last little while, I'm wondering if you have any observations on. The relationships that think tanks within Brussels have built, both within member states, for instance, and then, you know, even perhaps transatlantically, you know, one of the um, kind of instincts, I think, of larger think tanks is to build those very robust networks uh, across different jurisdictions, uh, not just for the purposes, I think, of expanding the research horizon, but also, I think, you know, there's obviously development opportunities, and, and I think there's, uh, you know, it's, there's no harm necessarily in establishing, I think, uh, epistemic links uh, across borders. So I'm wondering if you've observed any changes, uh, certainly in the time that you've been writing on these organizations um, with their relationships, perhaps vertically and then horizontally. Thank you very much um, for, for that. Um, so I'm going to look at, because I, I wrote initially in 2004, and then I basically left that. Um, and I've come back, you know, when once you've asked me to, to take a, a look again, um, and so I'm going to just base my, my comments on, on the current look um, the situation, or at least a few years ago when I pre-COVID. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the relationships are growing, definitely. Um, and there's, in fact, a chart in, my, uh, in the chapter where it shows the number of, of networks, um, and particularly those wave two, those, um, those think tanks that are looking to connect to member states huge number of increase in terms of, of memberships, partnerships. Um, so the wave two, you know, looking for to expand, to engage, have increased significantly. Um, those within the wave one who are doing research, they're the ones who are primarily looking at re, um, connections to universities. Uh, for example, the SEPs with universities, 
pretty serious scholars there. Um, and the EPC, I know you've written, focused quite a bit on EPC. They decided to do much fewer. They focus on some partners um, and they, they will focus their programs on, on their partners' interests as well. So there's sort of a um, relationship there. The third one, the, the third wave, um, the Bruegel, they, they do have connections. Um, they have uh, memberships, again, member states, part of their, their work there. But what I also found really interesting there is that their relationships, um, one, Bruegel has a, a person, one of the founding members, they, um, he works both for Bruegel as well as the Peterson um, Institute on International Economics in DC. And I thought that that was fascinating um, and something really to look at to see, you know, how that person's work is bridging the two worlds there. Um, and then I also found that Bruegel has connections and others as well, but just focusing on Bruegel here, um, they also have connections to international organizations, um, World Trade Organization, OECD. So those are fascinating um, partnerships as well. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Nana, I'm wondering if we could shift gears a bit um, and talk more about the relationship between think tanks and populism. When, when, when I, I read the chapter you did, I was absolutely fascinated by it. There were a number of things that came to mind. One, just as a scholar of think tanks, uh, what challenges you had to overcome in focusing on, on the Trump presidency, because as you know, Donald Trump's relationship uh, inside the Beltway with think tanks was very, very different than many previous presidents. So I'd be very interested in your insights about that. And uh, also just in terms of the different networks that you observed and how much overlap there is uh, between them, but also to focus on this whole issue of influence and impact, uh, something that we address uh, in a section uh, in the book. So I'm wondering if you could start off perhaps talking about Donald Trump, his presidency and the relationship with think tanks and then perhaps move on to talk about not only the challenges in studying networks, but trying to kind of parse out how much of an impact or, or imprint uh, that these organizations have within different policy circles. Uh, thanks, Don. I'm, I'm sure not uh, do justice to that uh, question in, in its entirety. It's okay. Um, but uh, no, I mean, in a way, uh, we approach this, as I said, not so much by looking at think tanks, by but, but by looking at, at people that make policy making, and then kind of you know uh, relating that back to the to the sources of of, of policy making. In uh, 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 not, not not so much the sources of policy making, but we take their their worldview as part of the, part of the source of policy making. And when we find affiliations with think tanks, we take that. Um, as as one of the sources for for the policy uh, uh, making. So in that sense, the way we see the influence from uh, the think tanks to policy making is actually, of course, there are all the reports and all the studies and all, all that, that 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 they are producing, and and that also uh, Carlin, for instance, is is uh, is 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 um, producing, and 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 that I'm sure that's also influencing policy. But this is the this is the influence through people basically through through the links of of people and 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 the way that kind of then is translated uh, into power and because trump uh was of course you know a complete outsider and also was elected on the basis of being an outsider and on this message of say draining the swamp right, right. Uh, it was it was almost obvious that he would that he would not connect to that to that to that world to that network to that kind of way of thinking and that elite those elite circles um and of course there were some people in his administration that that were connected and i have to say also that we only look at the key uh we, we only have a selection of 30 top foreign policy makers so that's also a limitation right we don't know about all those other people working in administrations at much at different positions and at lower positions and so on uh but in this selection of top foreign policy makers that we selected from trump yeah, we found that they were they were outsiders in terms of their previous uh, political positions. They had hardly any experience in policy making, uh, but they were also outsiders in terms of their connection uh, to to that to 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 what Walt called like the blob, right? So these 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 foreign policy uh, uh, think tanks, um, and and the difficulty that presented to our work is that since we argue that 
previous connections and perhaps future connections and recurrent connections of policymakers to these think tanks helps us understand our foreign policy making by looking at what these think tanks actually stand for and produce in terms of uh, policy planning and ideas for how policy policy making should be conducted and what direction it should take we were of course at a loss when we wanted to understand trump's foreign policy making because we couldn't go to those think tanks and the reports they produce and so on so you need kind of additional sources to understand trump's policy making and uh, in general, it's very hard to understand Trump's foreign policy making because it was rather chaotic, rather erratic, uh, and uh, and 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 sometimes, you know, you question whether it's even sens sensical to f to try and find motives and and direction in his foreign policy making. So I think we we were we were indeed struggling uh, struggling with that, um, but the way um, the way we interpreted that um, that f that phenomenon and and and. and you know, the phenomenon of Trump <laughs> and the disconnect that he presented to the U.S. foreign policy elite and the think tanks was that this, this basically was a signal of a crisis of the foreign policy elite in Washington, a, a, a crisis of the foreign policy making they had been implementing for decades. And, and that crisis was, you know, partly a, a huge disconnect between a large share of the, the electorate and, and that policy making elite. And, and of course, on the basis of that disconnect, actually, Trump got himself elected, although he was partly also, you know, in, corp in corporate sense, he was very much part of that of, of that elite, but, mm -hmm. but not in, in the way of his, his thinking. And so that, that, that wider crisis of, say, elite leadership and elite foreign policy making, um, yeah, that, that, that we found really interesting, right? Because that also kind of opens up all, all kinds of avenues for other kinds of research, uh, other sources of, uh, of, of policy making and other motives for policy making. Uh, but I think it's also partly um, uh, the reason why, uh, for instance, the Biden administration is now actually, although many people in his team are kind of the old hands, the experienced foreign right. policy makers, from the Obama administration, you would right. you would expect kind of a reconnect, right? So a resurrection of all those networks that we mm -hmm. have found to exist for Biden, Bush, uh, Obama, then didn't exist when Trump was there. And you would you you would expect a resurrection. And I think we partly will see that a reconnect, right? So the blob is back, basically. Um, but that's not entirely the whole story, right? First of all, Biden has partly you know composed a different kind of team, and there are more there's more diversity. Uh, in terms of, of the people in, in his uh, foreign policy team. And also in terms of the foreign policy making, you see that some of the, um, some of the uh, characteristics that Trump actually started with, which is much more focused on a domestic growth, reshoring, uh, talking about decoupling, right? And much more restrained in terms of uh, uh, the US global role. So they basically reversal of the liberal internationalism that has been prevalent in US foreign policy making. You see parts of that still, still being prominent in Biden's uh, foreign policy making. Uh, so, and I think that that should be related to the to the broader rift and the broader crisis that I think that Trump represented, and and that we could read off in these think tanks. Um, okay, so, so I'm not at all answering your question, but I'm trying to say a few things I wanted to, I wanted to bring to the fore. And actually, yeah. I have a, I have a question myself. Can I pose it? Yes, of course. Okay, I have a question for 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 Carlin because you know. As an outsider from this world studying it, we have these assumptions and these claims and so on about the crisis of, of this foreign policy elite. And, and that kind of, you know, helped Trump. And, and I also kind of use it now to try and understand Biden and so on. But you are inside that world. <laughs> you are inside one of these institutes that I, that, I, that I analyze from the outside. Do you recognize there, that was there within AEI also this sense of, there is a disconnect between our thinking and our, you know, the way we influence policy and, and the way we recruit for, for top positions in the administration and what's going on in wider society. And, and was there a sense of, yeah, I don't know, I call it crisis, but at least a sense of we should, maybe there's something we should change in, in the way we, we, we think about policymaking, the way we advise policymakers, the way we recruit. Uh, and the way we we also uh, uh, recruit for the for for, the, for government positions. Well, Nana, I haven't read your chapter yet, and I look forward to doing so. But I wanted just to make a point of, based on what you were saying a little bit earlier, in that I think the economic arena is very different from the foreign policy arena. I think, as you saw in the Trump administration, you had a lot of.
you know, very familiar faces going in and out. This is a small elite of people. They all know each other. They all work together. They've known each other for a very long period of time. And my sense is that, that there was, I mean, if you could put the foreign policy differences, let's say at the 20 yard lines on a playing field, you might put the differences between uh, some of the major Trump and, and, and Biden initiatives within the 40 yard lines, maybe just much closer together. And these people again are moving in and out all the time. But I think clearly there has been a rethink at, um, and AI was certainly not uh, in the, particularly in the economic and foreign policy arena, there were very few strong Trump supporters at AI, no question about that. And and quite a bit of um, a very serious criticism of the endeavors. But I, I think the recognition, not only here, but also in Europe of the populist current that is so important has caused all of us to you know, think again about whether or not we're missing something in American policy that, that needs very, very careful attention and whether or not there are people we might bring in. I doubt very much they would be people from the Trump administration, but people that we could bring into AI that might give us a clearer sense of that perspective. But you know, basically, we stuck to our knitting during the during the Trump administration to the things we've been working on for a very long time, and and I obviously didn't engage as much. You 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 want the U.S. government to be successful, and so um, I think there's always a bit of a reticence to give the people in power a lot of maneuvering room with where they want to at least start with policy overall. Could I ask a follow-up question? Sure, of course you can. So, so I, I read um, Christopher's um, chapter on Atlantic Drift, and he identifies the roles um, primarily of, of U.S., Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway, um, as well as supranational in Brussels. And for the, um, I'm just going to very quickly paraphrase what you're saying, Chris. Um, and basically, he's saying that the, the um, think tanks in, in D.C. and in, in the U.S. are basically focused on media and testimony to Congress. That's where they get... That's what their priorities are for their roles. And I'm wondering, given what we're hearing from NANA and the foreign policy, and I know the AEI is economics, but did you see, um, Carlin, did you see a, a, de a significant decrease in, in requests for media, um, you know, talking um, or speaking roles or testimony to Congress during the Trump uh, term? No, um, one of the think things that think tanks do in the United States now, the major think tanks, we measure everything. And our congressional testimony was up, our media hits were up, our, our publications in, in prominent, in the, in the most prominent uh, print and um, digital publications were all up over the course of the Trump years. And so people came to us basically to say, well, what do you think of X, Y, Z? So no change, no change, just continued growth in that area in part because we have a bigger communication staff and they're out promoting our work all of the time in so many unique ways. And that's just a very impressive operation. And we saw no uh, diminishment in any kind of coverage at all. That's interesting. And maybe if I can just piggyback then and, and Heidi, maybe throw it back to you for a moment, just in the context of supranational think tanks who, you know, I, I think we can broadly agree play by a slightly different set of rules in terms of their metrics of success, in terms of uh, what they seek to accomplish within their particular political arena and, uh, you know, public policy space. So, I mean, through the, the course of the Trump years, I mean, did you notice at, at all, Heidi, an increase in, in the level of, um, you know, for example, consultation that think tanks uh, deliver before the commission or other, um, uh, you know, policy bodies? Did you notice uh, any changes in, and kind of the their grouping, the particular groupings that they were assembling uh, for their events and for their their kind of networking function, which which I believe they they fulfill. So uh, thanks for that, Chris. So again, I didn't really I sort of stepped out of that world for for a bit. So I only came back just looking, you know, in 2019. So toward, mm -hmm. towards the tail end, um, but I definitely note that you know they they very much are work, working on bringing people together. I mean, you press that as well, and. Uh, very much um, bringing people together within the commission, uh, within again broader the broad, broader Brussels arena, corporations, member states when they're when they're interested, the corporations coming from various member states as well. But same thing as with with in the U.S. as Carlin noticed, um, the, the the stress on communications, um, most all all of them now, and in, in some more so than others, have 
you know, regular podcasts. They have really active Twitter accounts um, as well. So there, there is very much that, that commonality there. Chris, if I could just add uh, one quick point, and then I thought we might want to look at, uh, give our audience an opportunity to ask some questions as well. Uh, I, th I thought Carl, uh, Carlin's comment about uh, media activity, invitations increasing to provide uh, congressional testimony uh, and other things was, was, was quite enlightening and, and, and right on point. And I think what think tanks in the United States have realized for many, many decades is that when one door closes, another one can be opened. And that rather than burying their heads in the sand until a different administration assumes power, think tanks need to reevaluate their strategies, how best to get their ideas uh, in the marketplace and, and how to effectively promote them. So uh, Carlin's observation and, and, and also piggybacking on what Heidi and Nana have said is extremely important. The role of think tanks in facilitating the role of think tanks in providing uh, stakeholders with different products that they can consume, uh, the level of engagement, all of those things are so critically important. And it's those think tanks like AEI and others who are in it for the long haul, who don't get distracted uh, by four years of a particular uh, president who are able to stay the course. So I, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Enrique has a question, right? Yeah, Enrique it, had a, he had a question. Yeah. Is it when is it when politics seem to be not based on evidence oh, that sorry. the public looks for think tanks to help them make sense of what is going on? Yes, I had was, exactly the same thought when uh, Carlin was uh, was telling that that actually the increase for <laughs> advice and ideas was uh, there was an increase during Trump. Carlin, what would your what would your response be to Enrique's question? Well, let me go back and just quickly look at it again. Um, I'm not I, sure that's entirely fair. There's certainly a lot of competition in the realm of ideas generally. And I'm not, I'm not in, in other words, the premise of the question there, there's always been a lot of competition in, in let's say, looking at an area like climate, not necessarily on its existence or something like that. But I think that, that this was just an opportunity for everybody to sort of sharpen their skills and think more right. carefully about what it was that we were we were looking at and were there other arguments that needed to be examined. Um, so I don't think I would be, I do think a lot of the Trump administration's policies were based on evidence, not evidence that I'm particularly familiar with or that I might support, but um, I think that's only fair to them that it caused us to sort of rethink and look at things again. Okay, very, very good. Carlin, I'm wondering if you could touch on this and, and, and perhaps uh, Nan and Heidi as well, the important role that philanthropic foundations play in supporting the work of think tanks. And I thought you made some very interesting observations uh, before Carlin about how this landscape has, has, has changed over time. That 10, 15, 20 years ago, you used to be able to rely on the same corporations, the same foundations for support operational support, specific project support. If you could perhaps just shed a little bit more light on the challenges facing the advancement side and finding those dollars in a much more competitive marketplace of ideas. And if Nana and Heidi can contribute uh, some thoughts, that would be great because that's always a piece that people are interested in, the relationship between foundations, corporations, and, and think tanks. Yes, it's a very big question. I mean, one of the things we've always tried to do at AI, and it's not necessarily always possible, is to insulate our scholars from their funders. I and mean, that's a right. basic point to start with. But that's a different question from whether the philanthropic giving pattern is changing. And again, I'm not an expert in this area. It has been my impression that corporations have wanted to be less political, that corporate foundations are, are being much more aggressive and assertive in their dealings with think tanks in terms of, let's say, having a certain amount of diversity on your board, having diversity in, in various projects, something that we didn't see 10 years ago. So that's a, or maybe 15 years ago, that's a new development where, where, where a, major cor a major corporate foundation or philanthropic foundation might say, well, I'm eager to support you, but I won't unless you've got X, Y, unless you do X, Y, Z. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, there's a bigger footprint in that regard. Our, major source of donations is still individuals. Um, they're 
contributing some very substantial sums of money. Um, but again, I don't I, I, I don't know a lot about how that actually works when it trans we pretty much determine our own research agendas. We we don't have research agendas in the way that other think tanks do. We invest in individuals and give them an enormous amount of free reign. It's a it's a pretty it's a great luxury overall. But I wanted to get back to something you had said earlier, Don, because I think it is something that we wouldn't have done, and I know it's beginning to be true at other think tanks. Um, we are now uh, working with a very substantial group. We started with about 50 people, um, mid-career professionals at the state and local level. We think that these are going to be the policy makers of the future. We now have a thousand people in that group in a matter of just a couple of years who are you know, mid-level mayors, uh, whatever it might be in various cities, because we see these as the future leaders. And we know that we not only can, we can't rely on that cadre of very well-regarded economists and foreign policy experts who've been, who know each other and have been around for a long time. And so we're really going down below in a way that we've never done before. And I think that's something you'll see at other think tanks. And that relates to an, an earlier question of yours. I wish I was more of an expert on on how various think tanks in Washington are funded, but I do know that giving patterns have changed. Great, thank you. Nana, uh, any observations that you can offer in terms of looking at the specific networks and, and the relationships that think tanks have formed with different stakeholders? Hmm. Yeah, actually, I mean, not in the chapter, but in in the book, we uh, we actually try to also map some of the corporate of the, the funding sources of of the think tanks in this central kind of the biggest think tanks that were centrally connected to the different presidencies and administrations, and we found that they're, that they're, they're they're largely funded by these big transnational corporations, right? And we didn't look so much at individual funders, but you know, company company uh, funders, yeah. and actually. This is not a very transparent issue. There are some <laughs> think tanks that actually are transparent about their, their their sources, and some are not. So we could only do it for for a few. So I was I was very intrigued when Carlin started talking about you know the difficulty now to get to get money from these corp big corporations and and the diversity of, of funding and so on. So I was, it's really something preparing for this talk today. I thought about it again. I want to look into it again. Also, we didn't do it for the Trump administration. There was there was right. hardly a network, but I, I would I would really like to see to look into that now. And I, I find it really interesting what I'm learning uh, here. But I want to I want to bring in another thought. What that is that, you know, one way to influence via is, you know, you give a lot of money <laughs> and you just promote. It's like lobbying. You, you promote your, your special interest. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Carlin can say, OK, we we get money from big corporations or for special interests, but it, it doesn't influence our thinking. We are like independent. And I, I totally, I mean, I, I believe you and I, I, I can see that. And maybe I, I'm, my assumptions are partly wrong. But the way we think about it is that the people that are also directing these institutes and that are then also later on um, uh, uh, maybe in, in, in government and, and influencing politics, that these people, they have worldviews of their own. And if these people are also... Um, directors at big multinational corporations that influences their thinking, that influences kind of the, yeah, what, what is normal, what is desirable, what's the limit of the possible, right? So it's not kind of a, a direct influence that money buys you influence for a particular special interest, but it's like the way the way you think, the way the world should be, like the worldview. And what we found is when we looked at the directors at these big uh, um uh, uh, think tanks that many of these directors, I think two thirds or so, or at least half, had had simultaneous board positions in big companies, and mm -hmm. so we took that to to also inform their their thinking and worldview. And and I don't know, I, I would be interested to to hear from from you as an insider also, and 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 the other experts on this panel. Maybe you take a, a different perspective on these issues, but I would be really uh, keen on 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 hearing your thoughts on that statement. Carlin, did you want to jump in? And then I'd li like to go to Heidi. Um, I, I guess it's true that most of our big donors are also on corporate boards. I've never, um, I confess I haven't thought too much about that. It's basically real, a reflection of the industries in which they became so prominent. So right. they know other directors on other big companies that are like them. Um, but, and I'm sure it does influence in many ways their worldview when these elites meet overall. I don't know whether anyone has mentioned yet, but I, I'm not sure you've seen this in the in the press, but there is new going to be a new Trump think tank. Wow. 
Just what, thought what, you'd what? want to know. Just thought you'd want to know. They announced it last week, and um, I didn't recognize any of the names of. Uh, uh, they only mentioned a few names of people who might be involved in this, but in fact, uh, they are setting up a think tank. Uh, Heidi, uh, any comments on, you know, e EU think tanks, Brussels-based think tanks, and the importance of fundraising or, or yeah. different changes you've seen as they've evolved over time? Yeah, thank you, Don. So I'll talk to that, and as well as I'll talk to the, the world of you and how you know the role that that think tanks in Brussels really play in that for for the decision makers. So I again, there's a chart in the chapter that um, shows um, the the budgets and where. And in, in speaking to some the people within these think tanks, um, you know, they all were felt they they all felt that the stress um, from the economic downturn, um, the, the the crisis uh, in Europe. Um, across the board, pretty much, um, some more than others. But for the most part, um, for example, at wave one, um, for example, SEPs, they primarily, they have 41% uh, of their funding comes from, from contract bids within primarily the commission. Um, and then they also get some money from, from national governments, but also a huge amount, 39% comes from corporate sponsors, uh, membership sponsors. And, and Chris, you mentioned that, how important that is across the board in Brussels. Um, as we go into wave two, again, there are the more the, the, the ones connected to European political parties. Because of that regulation, they were most of their funds, the vast majority of their funds come from the European Union budget. Um, and then as we go into the, the third wave, um, it, that's primarily Bruegel because the, the other one is within uh, the commission. Um, they're looking across the board corporations um, and uh, member states um, and then some foundations as well. So you'll see that through the, the various waves, it shifts from mostly the, the, the contract work to, to membership. And I think across the board now, the, fact the membership is so important, um, bringing those people together as well. But the fact on, on bringing those people together, um, I also spoke with people inside the commission and inside the parliament, how they use uh, that, that information, how they use the platforms that these think tanks offer. And they all were so welcoming to that that chance to go speak off sometimes off the record speak to various people um, not only at the think tanks but across the policymakers that are coming to these events to be able to share their ideas for various policy ideas so just a fundamental point is how their world view how their regional view changed uh, because they were able to hear from other speakers um, off, off the record a lot of times that's great uh, Chris, I, I'm wondering if you would be so kind just to, to, to speak briefly about the project that uh, involved our three uh, very prominent and distinguished guests, and, um, and perhaps uh, if, if, if you could uh, just bring the panel to a close. I know we're running out of time, and then at the end, I'd like to just add a, a few thank yous of my own. Yeah, certainly, Don. Thanks, um, and thank you to the, the team at On Think Tanks for organizing this. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the genesis of this this panel really came from uh, the handbook on uh, on think tanks that uh, think tanks and public policy that uh, was released just last month by Edward Elgar Publishing. It was uh, a multi year project that, uh, that Don and I co edited, and of course uh, the three panelists here uh, contributors uh, in their own right to, to the volume among approximately twenty six uh, unique uh, authors as part of this book. So it emerged, I think, from you know, a few recognitions. First, that uh, we, we did not feel at that time that there was a kind of a sufficient, I think, broad in scope uh, appreciation of, of just the different nuances within the think tank literature that had emerged over the last several decades, to be fair, as, as this uh, kind of subgenre of research has really uh, increased in prominence and interest, uh, certainly from scholars, but also I think Don can attest from students alike. I'm, I'm a student of, of Don's. Uh, you know, within that uh, kind of think tank lineage. So uh, I've certainly observed a growing interest of, uh, in that among my uh, kind of junior colleagues as well. So we really sought to, to cross geography, to cross methodologies, to cross um, scope and field of interest. Uh, you know, certain political science certainly holds prominence in, in kind of the, the origin uh, for many authors, but also it crosses into some sociological aspects as well. And of course, I think one of the main contributions that this book really makes is in leveraging um, those, in, quote, inside the tent, you know, like certainly Carlin, uh, in, in terms of bringing that appreciation and awareness of what, um, you know, actually 
actually occurs in think tanks at the operational uh, and scholastic level. Uh, you know, the temptation, I think, for a lot of scholars may be very well to, to you know, kind of a, adopt an arm's length between um, appreciating what, uh, you know, what the operational realities and constraints and opportunities of think tanks uh, present. So uh, this was certainly a goal of, of this handbook, and I think that, you know, we're very grateful for those who've, uh, who've lent their, their time to, to really kind of bring a look inside uh, what may be a black box to some. So we kind of organize the book around different sections that uh, that reflect that starting with I think some of the methodological challenges there's obviously a, a very perennial question about what constitutes the think tank and it's amazing to think that even at, at this point in, in the literature which is you know increasing in maturity that, that we're still asking that question but it's a very valid question and it's one that uh, that you know I certainly have not uh, seen a clear uh, unanimity of, of perspective or, or agreement on. So, I, I, I mean, it's a fascinating conversation that, uh, that certainly has continued through this book. Uh, we also talk, like I said, about uh, managing think tanks, so that, that look from the inside to the out. We also talk about the, you know, another kind of perennial question mark around influence and impact. These are terms that I think get bandied and, and certainly um, caricatured at times by those uh, you know, looking at think tanks and, and, and trying to determine exactly what their end goal is and, and how they measure and appreciate that. So we really unpack that. And Don, I think, has done an incredible amount of work in this space for, for many years. And I think his, his chapter in this is particularly profound as well. Uh, we also look at think tanks across different political systems. So, of course, Heidi's uh, contribution on the, the EU is, is certainly uh, very important here. And, and, you know, I think the, the geographic scope of that scholarship that uh, that Don and I were able to to leverage in this really is uh, is quite amazing and, and unprecedented, I believe, uh, in, in the literature. So we're we're very grateful for that. And then finally, uh, a look at think tanks in populist contexts. Um, you know, this is certainly a trend that uh, that we've seen over the last several years. I think uh, it would be far too tempting to perceive uh, Trump's uh, you know failure to get reelection as kind of the end of, uh, of populism within the U.S. or um, more broadly speaking, globally, uh, I think that the, perhaps is more of a symptom than, than anything. So, uh, the the role of think tanks in contributing to that, but also mitigating that, and depending on their particular ideological persuasion, I think is uh, is a really interesting conversation that inevitably we're going to be having for for many years to come. Um, so that's that's a lot of talking for me, and uh, <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Don. But very very grateful for the opportunity, and very very thankful for our three panelists here for taking the time this this morning or afternoon. Wherever, uh, wherever we are in the world. Th thanks so much, Chris. I just have uh, two minutes to wrap up. Uh, first, let me thank uh, On Think Tanks uh, for their wonderful conference uh, to Enrique and his very, very talented uh, group of colleagues and staff. I can't thank you enough uh, for doing what, you're, what you continue to do. It is so very much appreciated. Uh, my profound thanks uh, to Carlin, to Nana, to Heidi, uh, not only for your exceptional chapters, uh, but for taking the time today uh, to share your thoughts and insights. It's so very much appreciated. Uh, this was a project that in some ways fell into our lap uh, a couple of years ago. And um, uh, Chris was the first person I thought of uh, in terms of co-editing this volume. Uh, uh, Chris was a former PhD student of mine. Uh, but I see him uh, as a, a friend and, and a distinguished colleague and uh, has done some wonderful, wonderful work in this in this field. So the fact that we were able to bring together such a distinguished group of contributors uh, really was, I think, a testament to the important role that think tanks play and the recognition that has uh, come their way in the scholarly community. So I could not be more grateful. Uh, to all of the contributors. I think Heidi is the only one with a copy of the book in her hands. Chris and I still haven't received one. There it is. Looks good. Uh, so hopefully you'll be getting yours in the mail uh, shortly. But again, thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion about this topic. Uh, it gives us reason to move on uh, and to study these institutions even further. So stay safe. Keep well. And hopefully the next time we meet, it will be in person. So thank you again, Chris, Nana, Carlin, Heidi. Thank thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Have a good day. Nice evening. Yes.